I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, coming from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice from the throne saying, Behold the tabernacle of God with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself with them shall be their God. Words taken from the Apocalypse and used for the introit of Our Lady of Lourdes feast day in February 11th. St. Cyprian, he famously stated, no one can have God as father who does not have the church as mother. No one can have God as father who does not have the church as mother. And we looked at St. Paul and he declared, it's an amazing phrase from 1 Corinthians toward the end of the book. If any man love not our Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. Wow. The same apostle says elsewhere in multiple places that the church is the body of Christ. Thus, by logical deduction, since it's the body of Christ, the church we can say, using St. Paul, if any man love not the church, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. That's called the theological conclusion and it's accurate. It is part of our duty then to love the church. True piety will not allow anything else. She's our mother. For the priest... She's our spouse. She's my bride. Oftentimes you hear now, oh, the priest, he's not married. What? I'm not? I'm married. I have a spouse. She's infinitely lovable. And our union is not until death do us part. It's until death bring us together for all eternity. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So all this stuff we hear about celibacy of the priest, watch out. That's going to hurt the priest. He's already married. The famous medieval theologian, Blessed Isaac of Stella taught, the church is incapable of forgiving any sin without Christ. And Christ is unwilling to forgive any sin without the church. Christ is unwilling to forgive any sin without the church. He goes on, Christ will not forgive the sin of anyone who despises the church. What God has joined together, man must not separate. This is a great mystery, but I understand it as referring to Christ and his church. He quoted St. Paul. So the church and Christ, they go together. If you want Christ to forgive your sins, it's got to be through his bride, which is the church. Loving the church, therefore, leads to sins being removed, to healing. It leads to union with God. In the Apocalypse, we read how St. John is commanded to arise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that adore therein. But the court, which is without the temple, cast out and measure it not. Measure within, not without. Elsewhere, St. John indicates why we should not bother with what is outside the church. He says in his first letter, Love not the world, nor the things which are in the world. If any man love the world, the charity of the Father is not in him. Don't bother with that stuff out there. Work on what's inside. Loving the world leads to mortal sin is what St. John is saying. If any man love the world, the charity of the Father is not in him. What is that? That's mortal sin. Charity's gone. Loving the church leads to healing. Loving the church leads to life. Working on things outside the church, apart from her, leads to death. The 19th century Carmelite mystic, Blessed Francis Palau, he put it this way. She, the church, is the mistress of the universe. All creatures serve her. 
Apart from her, there is no salvation, there's no life or happiness, but only restlessness, discontent, and eternal torment. What is all this telling us? What is this saying? True piety, godliness that opens the gates of heaven, godliness whose prayers are heard on high, Godliness that enables us to respect and love each other is only possible inside the church. We cannot piously and devoutly love God as father, nor our fellow man as brother, without loving the church as mother. We cannot overcome our sins and expiate all their harmful effects without the church. No wonder then, many saintly souls insisted on always being identified as children of the church. Famously, St. Teresa of Jesus said over and over that she was a daughter of the church. St. John of the Cross cried out, Oh my Jesus, I love thee. I love my mother, the church. St. Therese, the little flower, she exclaimed, I want to be a daughter of the church. That is the overall goal of my life. Blessed Francis Palau once wrote, My mission is to announce to the people that the Holy Church, which he always identified as Roman, by the way, he had these mystical visions of the church. He said, My mission is to announce to the people that the Holy Church is infinitely beautiful and lovable and to tell them to love her. It would be a little thing for me to spend a thousand lives in her service. Blessed Francis, always seeking to maintain verticality, piety therefore teaches us to remain inside of her confines, to map out her courtyards, to gaze upon her towers, and to know her streets. You can read about it in Psalms 47. That's what it says. Map out her towers. Look at her streets. St. John did this in the apocalypse in some ways. Just as piety knows its end, we spoke about that yesterday, a pious soul thinks he's going to go to purgatory usually, but he knows his end is to be with God. Now today, we need to talk about the means. We need to embrace the means to get to the end. And that's the church. She's also, in some way, the end itself. For heaven is the church triumphant. At the end of the sacred scriptures, St. John gives us these sobering words. He says, For I testify to everyone that heareth the word of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add to these things, God shall add unto him the plagues written in this book. If any man shall take away from the words of this book, of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from these things that are written in this book. St. John, the Apocalypse, chapter 22. Now this principle easily applies to the entire deposit of the faith. It is the same as saying, Stay within her confines. Measure the inner courts. Thus, piety seeks only what has been given from above and handed down from the saints, repelling additions and subtractions, innovations and novelties. Resist, remembering the saying of the apostle, Jesus Christ, yesterday and today, and the same forever, be not led away with various and strange doctrines. St. Paul, no strange doctrines, no additions, no subtractions. This is it. This has been given to us from above. Piety wants to make me think like God. Piety wants to make me see like God sees. Not make Him see things as I do. God, you need to think like I do. I'm going to make you think like I do. That's what's happening to us today. That's the inversion. Very deadly to piety. Furthermore, this is why the great saints and doctors and theologians of the church have always used piety as a measuring stick of orthodoxy. 
basically saying in so many words, as I've already stated over and over, it's worth stating again, in theology there's no place for anything what does not foster piety. If it doesn't foster piety, then I don't want it. It's not of God. It's not vertical. The great medieval saints and doctors, such as Thomas Aquinas, Bonaventure, they use piety many times in choosing among differing theological opinions, stating such as this one, quote, it is more constant with the piety of the faith. It is more ardently influences our affections. Therefore, we're choosing this one. That's how they did it. When reading books that do not feed our piety then, but cause anger and other passions to rise, put them aside, throw them out. Not the time for you to be reading that book. Maybe it's not for you at all. Or looking at that website, that blog. Doesn't it foster piety? Is it really helping us? Sad to say, this inspiring godliness has waned a lot in these last decades. Thus, the reason for this mission. As a result, the church is no longer loved. She's no longer loved and seen as the spotless bride of Christ, as the perfect society. Using the words of Pope Pius XII, surpassing all other societies as grace surpasses nature, as things immortal are above those that perish. That's the church. Many look upon her merely as a worldwide institution that can be manipulated, used for their own ends. Consequently, for some time now, we've been told various strange things about God's holy church. Even from those holding high places in our own hierarchy, things such as, well, the church has defects. We've been told that she has made mistakes in the past. We've been told that she's still learning about herself and needs to grow up. We've been told that she's locked in upon herself in small things and small-minded rules. We've been told that she's in a process of self-awareness, self-realization, or is evolving into some newer thing. There's going to be a future convergence, whatever that means. Not very long ago, it hurts to even say this. We heard from a cardinal that the church is, quote, a dogmatic, self-engrossed, and authoritative, sick institution, end quote. Dorothy Day quotes Cardinal Mundelein of the previous century, saying, too often has the church been lined up on the wrong side. Hmm. Does this sound right to you? Does this sound pious? What about those famous words of Paul VI uttered in 1968? He said, the church finds herself in an hour of anxiety, a disturbed period of self-criticism, or what would even better be called auto-destruction. It is almost as if the church were attacking herself. 1968, Pope Paul VI. Now, all these statements about the Holy Church should not sit well with us. They should not sit well with our piety simply because they are detracting from the sense of verticality that we're supposed to have and ought to have of the true reality of the church. Remember what Pope Pius XII said? Surpassing all other societies as grace surpasses nature. She's supernatural. Although these statements may have some slivers of truth to them as applying to this or that fallen member of the church, past or present, including those who actually stated those things, can they be said to hold for the church? Does she really have defects? Does she make mistakes? Can she attack herself? Can she even get sick? Is she really locked in on herself with small-minded rules? Is she in some kind of an evolutionary process toward a future convergence 
or to some omega point. Hmm. What does a pious and faithful son of the church do? What is our duty? We have to ask ourselves that. First of all, this is our duty. Number one, he makes sure that he's not misunderstood the statements of the prelates who spoke, seeking to give them the benefit of the doubt as well as time to make clarifications. Since the statements just provided have continued to mount one upon another for some time now, without any clarification following, we can rest assured that we have heard properly and we have understood. Second, now that we've passed that stage where we've given the benefit of the doubt, we've waited it out, we've listened to their statements. Now what do we do? Well, we must avoid passing any judgment upon persons. That's not our job. We leave that to his majesty, the judge. To go there is to undermine and eventually destroy our Catholic piety. It's very dangerous. The devil delights in this sort of behavior. For such ones, he will surely coax into becoming traitors to God's cause sooner or later. He's very skilled at this. And he's been doing it with much success. Third, after we've avoided passing judgment on the individual, we're not interested in that, the faithful and pious son does not blindly defend every action of a prelate. That would be an excessive or unhealthy form of clericalism. There is a good form of clericalism. The priest is married to the church. I mean, he's a special gift from God. We better be clerical. We're in trouble. Now listen to Melchior Cano, great Dominican theologian of the Council of Trent. He said, those who blindly and indiscriminately defend every decision of the Supreme Pontiff, read here any prelate of the church. If it holds for the Pope, holds for them all. Those who blindly and indiscriminately defend every decision of the Supreme Pontiff are the very ones who do the most to undermine the authority of the Holy See. They destroy instead of strengthening its foundations. End quote, Melchior Cano. Thus, the faithful son of the church dutifully seeks to resist all error and false teaching without touching the person of the prelate. That's what the faithful, pious Catholic does. Not easy, but it needs to be done. He resists without losing his love and devotion to the Pope and the hierarchy. Pope St. Pius X expressed it like this. Fight error without touching the individual. Fight error without touching the individual. We might say fight error without touching the office. I don't want to bring the office down with this person that's in it. The devil would like that. Pope Paul IV, 1559, declared in a papal bull, an apostolic bull, that this is possible, saying the Pope is judged by none in this world, but may nonetheless be contradicted, he may be resisted, if he be found to have deviated from the faith. Thus, there is a distinction between judging a prelate and resisting him. Between loving the hierarchy and not approving of erroneous opinions and poor behavior and bad governance. Now, St. Thomas Aquinas teaches us that there being an imminent danger for the faith, prelates must be questioned, rebuked even if necessary, even publicly by their subjects. The prophet Nathan questioned King David in order to correct him, but he was the right man for the job. I think sometimes we Americans think we're the right man for the job with all our blogs. I'm not so sure it's very effective. But in any case, he went to the king and he questioned him and he caught him and he said, you're the man. He made the king answer his own problem and he was able to say, you're the man. That was very good how he did that. He didn't fall into ridicule. He didn't fall into personal attacks on the king. He 
corrected him of his error. Sister Lucia of Fatima, she wrote to her priest nephew, it is necessary not to let yourself be drawn away by the doctrines of disoriented contradictors. The campaign is diabolical. We need to confront it without getting into conflicts. We need to confront it without getting into conflicts. That's not easy, but that's what we have to do. That's what the pious son does. Here's the current code of canon law. Canon 212 states that this can be done by the faithful with due reverence and respect according to the office and dignity of the prelate being addressed. If it involves the papal office, which has the highest of dignities on earth, obviously such resistance and corrections must be carried out with the greatest care. Something sad to say, I think few are doing today. Thus, the reason for this talk, godliness seems to be waning everywhere. Are there any godly bloggers out there? I wonder. You really fear for their souls. They may be right, but they're not pious and it's not pleasing to God. And they won't receive grace for what they're doing. Ask yourself that question. Next time you read some of those things, is this building up my piety or is my anger rising? Discern the spirits. Now, with this in mind, there's a simple and pious way to answer the concerns we have raised about all the hurtful statements regarding the Holy Church given earlier this evening. It is found at Lourdes. It's found in the niche. It is Our Lady. The Immaculate Virgin Mary is the perfect image, the perfect type, the perfect member of the church. She's the neck of the mystical body through whom all the graces flow from the head to the members, from the altar to the nave. She's the mother and queen of the church. She is, as it were, the alpha and the omega of all that it is to be the church. To see her is to see the church at once. Blessed Isaac of Stella comes to our aid with this vital principle. He says, in the inspired scriptures, what is said in a universal sense of the Virgin Mother, the church, is understood in an individual sense of the Virgin Mary. And what is said in a particular sense of the Virgin Mother, Mary, is rightly understood in a general sense of the Virgin Mother, the church. When either is spoken of, the meaning can be understood of both, almost without qualification. Okay, what is he saying? This means we can always piously check the soundness of our ecclesiology, that's our understanding of the church, with our Mariology, that's our understanding of the Blessed Mother. You can always check in either direction. This is a very powerful tool that I hope you will see in a few moments. Blessed Francis Palau reflected on the same connection and often experienced it in mystical transports happening by the way in or near a cave. Put a bookmark there. We'll talk about that. Blessed Francis spends no little time explaining how the Blessed Virgin Mary is the perfect type, perfect figure of the church such that to see her is to see the church at once. Whatever is said of Mary about perfection, purity, holiness is fitting in a much more excellent and sublime way to be said of the church, he writes. She, Blessed Mary, is a clear mirror in which the Holy Church can be seen. Blessed Francis. Yet at the same time, with the help of Our Lady herself, he goes to some pains to distinguish her from the church. Blessed Mary is the perfect type of the church, its preeminent member, even its queen and mother, but she is not the church herself. Thus, Blessed Mary purposely kept away from the Carmelite mystic for a time until he fell deeply in love with the mystical body, which is the bride of the priest, lest he fall too deeply in love with the church's perfect mirror, the neck. 
When the Blessed Mother appeared to her saintly Carmelite, she said to him, Look well at me, and in me and through me you will know your beloved. I am the bright, pure mirror in which she is represented. I am not the final end of man's love, but I am a figure of the church, pure virgin and fruitful mother. Wow, how true this is. So this means looking into this untarnished mirror, we can discover many things about our Holy Mother, the Roman Catholic Church and vice versa. As blessed Isaac Stella said so clearly, when either is spoken of, the meaning can be understood of both, almost without qualification. So, let's look into this mirror of mirrors to fuel our piety and overcome all the errors attacking the church today. I think we can do it. See, now we know from the fathers and the doctors, as well as a clear and unequivocal teaching of the magisterium, that the lady, our lady, is both virgin and mother. She was virgin before, during, and after the miraculous birth from her side of the blessed Lord and King, Jesus Christ, in the cave of Bethlehem. So too must the Holy Catholic Church be both virgin and mother, giving spiritual birth to all her children of God, all the children of God must be born of her. Have you not wondered at times, though, why God did not just make Christ from the slime of the earth as he did with Adam? Why not just start over again? Adam, you blew it. I'm just going to start over with our Lord, with Jesus. I'm going to make him from the slime of the earth. Here is a reason why that didn't happen. Because the church must be a mother. And so the Christ in order to be the firstborn of many brethren, had to be born of a virginal mother himself. We see the connection between then how the mystical body and the blessed virgin help us to understand God's mysterious plan. That's why he had to be born, so that we could be born. Now let's get a little more serious. Okay. We know the blessed and ever-Virgin Mary is immaculate in her conception. She has no stain of original sin or any personal sin whatsoever over her entire life. Ever-Virgin, ever-sinless. So St. Thomas says of her, we should simply say that the Blessed Virgin committed no actual sin, either mortal or venial. And what the canticle says is fulfilled. You are wholly beautiful, my love, and without blemish. St. Thomas, quoting Canticle of Canticles. Okay, Pope Pius IX, he provides quite a listing from the fathers and the doctors of how Mary is, quote, immaculate in every respect, entirely spotless, removed from every stain of sin, all pure, all stainless, end quote. Now, using our principle using our connection between ecclesiology and Mariology, you looking into the mirror, how much more can we say the same of the church? Namely, that she's immaculate, spotless, without flaw or wrinkle, not just in her conception from the side of Christ on Calvary, but throughout all time. Thus, St. Paul says to the Ephesians, Husbands, love your wives, as Christ also loved the church and delivered himself up for it, that he might sanctify the church, cleansing it by the laver of water in the word of life, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it might be holy and without blemish. What's he saying? There's no defects mentioned. Church is without blemish, spot or wrinkle, none. God forbid. That would be contrary to the scriptures, the fathers, the doctors, the magisterium, and our Mariology. We cannot but conclude to say the spotless bride of Christ, if she is claimed to have defects, that would be heresy. That's heresy. 
Anybody who claims that the spotless bride of Christ has defects, they are in big trouble. Now, what is more, both the church and the Blessed Mary, they're mysterious and wonderful beyond all comprehension. Blessed Pope Pius IX of happy and holy memory, he speaks thus of Our Lady in his apostolic constitution defining her immaculate conception four years before her Lord's. Listen to these amazing words. They're phenomenal. He says, far above all the angels and all the saints, so wondrously did God endow the Blessed Mother with the abundance of all heavenly gifts poured from the treasury of His divinity that this Mother, ever absolutely free from all stain of sin, all fair and perfect, would possess that fullness of holy innocence and sanctity. And here's the key part. Than which under God one cannot even imagine anything greater and which outside of God no mind can succeed in comprehending fully. Wow. What's he saying? Folks, for all eternity, God willing, we make it to heaven. We still will not fathom the mystery of the virgin. Outside of God, nobody can. How you like that? How much more the church? Let me repeat what we said a moment ago, just to make sure it clicks. She says, there's no holy or innocence or sanctity than which under God one cannot even imagine anything greater and which outside of God no mind can succeed in comprehending fully. Wow. Not even the saints and angels. In another place, the same holy pontiff states, God alone accepted. Mary is more excellent than all and by nature fair and beautiful and more holy than the cherubim and the seraphim to praise her. All the tongues of heaven and earth do not suffice. How much more true is this for the church? She's the preeminent member. The church is greater than Mary. Thus, the Christians of the first century said, the world was created for the sake of the church. The church is the goal of all things. We hear an echo of this in Blessed Francis Palau's writings, where he states, having conceived the plan, God uttered one word, and that word was the building of his church in the course of the centuries. All things are willed or permitted by God for the good of the church. The holy triumphant church is the end to whose glory everything and the entire universe are created. She is the mistress of the universe. All creatures serve her. Apart from her, there is no possible happiness. St. John of the Cross says the cosmos, the universe is a palace for the bride. For the church. Thus we call her the mystical body of Christ. This is why Blessed Francis Palau always saw her veiled. She would come and talk to him veiled in mystery in his ecstatic transports. What does this say about her being a self-engrossed institution? Now true, she is a visible institution, has a visible structures, that's so Our Lady had a body. She could be seen at one time. She walked on the earth. But how much more there was to both of them than what we can merely see with our eyes, physical appearances. Oh, and how wrong to reduce Our Lady to a mere outward and simple human instrument of God as the Protestants shamefully do. Oh, she just was this woman and he chose her and that was, he was done with her and that's that. Ah, uh, no. As if the Word made flesh would not want more for his mother. But the same holds for the church. She cannot be reduced to a mere human structure or institution. She is the mystical, mystical body of Christ, the Son of God, supremely lovable beyond our comprehension, even after we attain heaven for all eternity. Wow, do we know what she is, where we are?
how privileged we are to be a part of her. The church teaches that the Blessed Virgin is unique, singular, and perfect. Listen to the Canticle of Canticles. Speak so eloquently of our Blessed Mother. One is my dove. My perfect one is but one. She's the only one of her mother, the chosen of her that bore her. Now, Pope Pius IX teaches us that there's only one immaculate conception, saying the church made it clear, indeed, that the conception of Mary is to be venerated as something extraordinary, wonderful, eminently holy, and different from the conception of all other human beings, Pope Pius IX. Here is one obvious reason why evolution is erroneous, folks, a pseudoscience, stuff of fables and myths. It's from that river of doubt. Now think about it. If Adam evolved from lower species, that would require he be conceived in the womb of some brute animal. And since the commission of the original sin comes after his birth, well, then he would have had to have been immaculately conceived. Well, wait a minute. Our Lady said at Lourdes with great clarity and awe on March 25th, 1858, I am the Immaculate Conception. She didn't say I am one of a couple Immaculate Conceptions. I am the Immaculate Conception. A sort of definition of just who this woman really is. The Abbe Peyramal, the Dean of Lourdes, he almost fainted when he heard it. Couldn't believe it. Was the mother of truth incarnate incapable of telling the whole truth? Was there some other human conceived in such a manner? Was Pope Pius IX correct in his teaching about the uniqueness of her immaculate conception? Think about it. Either the magisterium and the church's perfect mirror, Our Lady of Lourdes, is wrong, or evolution is a doctrine of devils, a myth, a fable, something flowing from the river. Is it by accident that the apparitions at Lourdes precede Darwin by a little more than a year? Our Lady was preparing us. She was speaking to us. She's guiding us for those who have eyes and ears to see and hear. Now again, applying our principle, looking into the church's spotless mirror, we can see that the mystical body is also one, singular, unique, perfect. And therefore, she's not evolving. What is perfect does not evolve. Progressing to something new. No, she's arrived. What is perfect does not evolve. There's no future convergence for the church. Rather, what we know of is her future and final victory as the church triumphant of heaven, the holy city. We heard something of that at the beginning of this conference, and you can read more about it in the final chapters of the Apocalypse. In the Gospels, we learn that Our Lady spoke seven times. The number of perfection. Seven times for perfection. Read the Gospels. We don't even know all the words she stated, but we know from the Gospels that she spoke seven separate times. Sign of perfection. This means that the church, when speaking officially and authoritatively, speaks perfectly. Pope Pius XI taught that the church is the mystical body of Christ, the immaculate spouse of Christ, and consequently a most admirable mother and an incomparable and perfect teacher. Can she have taught something officially in the past that was not correct? Was she too harsh, misjudged some heretic or schismatic? Brace yourself for 2017, because they are going to try to rehabilitate Martin Luther. They're already trying. We were too hard on him. We said all these mean things. They were all wrong. He's not that bad. Does she really need to be apologized for? Again, this is the same as saying Our Lady did not speak perfectly. No, they both speak perfectly, such that the scriptures used for Our Lady's feast days is fulfilled in them both. He that hearkeneth to me shall not be confounded. 
He that hearkeneth to me shall not be confounded. Again, Blessed Francis Palau comes to our aid. He says of her, you're all beautiful. My spouse, your clear, serene face reveals an intelligence so keen that neither the shadows of the night nor the darkness can hide any secret or mystery from you. However deep it may be, your thoughts are always great, magnificent, and sublime. Your heart contains pure love and resides in it as fire in its own element. There's nothing in all your parts and members which is not perfect. And all the divine perfection together makes you infinitely beautiful and lovable. Wow! It's great to be Catholic. To have this beautiful bride of Christ is ours. Stay tuned, we're not done yet. Over the course of her magnificent life, the sinless and most innocent mother of God received seven swords of sorrow. She received them through her immaculate heart and soul. Although completely innocent and free of all blame and sin, she willingly embraced suffering. Likewise, the church, although perfect, sinless, blameless, innocent, most holy, has followed the path of her head. That is to Calvary. And so at times, when Our Lady visits us, as she did at La Salette and Fatima, she looked very serious. She did too at Lourdes a couple of times. She looked very serious. She did not smile very much at Fatima and La Salette and was even seen to weep at times, her statues are found weeping. How is this possible for one who is glorified in heaven? For one who is the greatest of all the saints? Clearly, she is mirroring the church militant, passing through a time of trial. They're so closely united. When the church militant suffers, She's suffering in some way. She can cry. Clearly, she is mirroring the church, a time when the sword of sorrow is caused by heresy, apostasy, betrayal, and most of all, sacrileges and blasphemies. It's passing once again through her most sweet and tender heart. Does this evangelical seriousness of the lady Shown at La Salette and Lourdes and Fatima at times at Lourdes. Not always. She smiled a lot there. But still, there's an evangelical seriousness to Our Lady. Suffering of the Virgin. Her weeping. Does this mean she's attacking herself? Hurting herself? Suffering from anxiety? That she is somehow sick due to her own fault? Suffering from... Anything like that? No. Perish the thought. Heresy. Hateful to our faith and piety. That is not possible for one who is perfect. You cannot suffer in these ways. How much more is this true for the church? So trying to put a happy face on some frivolous front upon the church in times like our own is offensive to God and our piety and undermines the evangelical seriousness Our Lady asked us to embrace at La Salette and Lourdes and Fatima, saying what? You know, penance, penance, penance. Pray for the conversion of sinners. Can you see Our Lady on Calvary in the foot of the cross smiling and laughing and putting on a false face as if, as if all were okay? Such thoughts are impious. In fact, all we seem to hear now is mitigate, mitigate, mitigate. Wait a minute. She said, do penance, penance, penance. What do we hear now? Mitigate, mitigate, mitigate. What was that conference on the family a couple months ago? I'll tell you what it was. Mitigate, mitigate, mitigate. Mitigate, mitigate, mitigate. That's what it is. Oh, come on. Give in, give in, give in. Give up, give up, give up. That's what's happening to us. This is not from Our Lady. It's not like her. She said, do penance, penance, penance. Put a bookmark there. We'll talk about it tomorrow. On the other hand, neither can we see her despairing in any way, right? We can't see that. She's in charge. Shrieking in pain and contortions that display a sense of deep insecurity. 
No way. Anxiety, lack of understanding, such that she starts to think she's been lied to? Absolutely not. Was she self-engrossed, filled with self-pity? Oh, no. None of these fit our lady. Rather, we find in her determination of one who loves to bear the cross in silence in union with her Lord and King for the glory of God and for the salvation of souls. We find a co-redemptrix piously standing firm in her place. Thus, Pope Benedict XV, reigning during World War I, stated, She, the Blessed Virgin, offered her son so generously in sacrifice to satisfy the justice of God that it may be said with reason that she cooperated in the salvation of the human race along with Christ. Co-redemptrix. St. Ambrose said, His mother stood before the cross and while the men fled, she remained undaunted. She did not fear the torturers. His mother offered herself to his persecutors. If you read the mystics, like Maria of Algrida, she said, can I die with you, please? How much more the church? Can this holiest of mothers, can she not care for the souls being lost? Like snowflakes in a snowstorm? She cares. She weeps. She's sorrowful. Can so courageous and unwavering a mother not know what she's about, suffering from doubts and anxieties? Piety says no to all that nonsense. She knows what's going on and she's suffering for it. Now a little bit more. Bear with me. In her holy womb, Our Lady encompassed the God-man, the Word incarnate. In her was all truth. Thus we read in the lesson on our special feast days, I am the mother of knowledge. In me is all grace of the way and of the truth. In me is all hope of life and of virtue. Come to me, all ye that desire me, and be filled with my fruits. Wow. So too the church is where Christ deposited the faith in its entirety. She possesses all truth in its fullness and it is her role to preserve this truth from all error. No wonder then it is Our Lady, the church's perfect mirror, perfect type, who keeps us from error and is called the hammer of heretics. All who fall away from Our Lady fall away from the truth. All who fall away from the church leave off true devotion to Mary. All who come to the church to remain re develop a deep devotion to the Immaculate Virgin. Thus, the saying of St. Cyprian, no one can have God as father who does not have the church as mother. Now, this is also symbolized in the struggle that took place between the time Our Lady appeared at Lourdes. Every conceivable power came up against her in an attempt to suppress the Lady of the Grotto. First, there were the devils raising an outcry in the River Gav. Then the city leaders, the police chief, the imperial prosecutor de Tour, the mayor... Lacadet, the scientists, the journalists, the scoffers, pretenders, mockers, and sham artists all took turns. Even the priests and the bishops, the sisters, the schoolmates, the family, the relatives, the friends, the foes, all took turns. Psychology failed, trickery and bribery failed. The government, all the way up to the emperor, were forced to give way. Each and all were utterly vanquished. The virgin most powerful beat them all back. Each and every one. Now, in the novel, it's not totally accurate, but there's an interest in the novel Song of Bernadette. We read this telling scene of one good man speaking to a scoffing worldly poet who is leaving Lourdes to return to Paris. In saying goodbye to this poet, the poet said, in saying goodbye, you have the lady to thank for this, my friend. She has put me to flight. Then he said, well, why the lady? I can't see what harm she's done you. Harm, he said. Seems to me that the lady is of a most tyrannical disposition. She demands that one take a decisive stand for her or against her. That's it. Well said. There it is. The Blessed Mother has the power to crush the head of the dragon and all the enemies of the church. For all time, in the end, therefore, we cannot but be for her or against her. 
How much more is this true of God's holy church? And therefore, piety latches on to what is superior in order to become superior itself. On what is of God, what is vertical. Once again, if you're going to stay in the church, you latch on to the mother. Does this not touch on why she came to us at Fatima in such a clear and decisive way as the woman clothed with the sun? working undeniable miracles such as opening the ground for the children to look upon the depths of hell, commanding the sun to come out of the sky down to the earth and threaten it. At her command, some 70,000 people saw it. The children noted carefully the power to do these things came from her hands. In her most grave messages to these little children, she said, referring to herself, only she can help you. Applying our principle, only the church and her most lovely and potent neck can help us be saved and overcome all evils that confront us in this world. And we know Oh, how we know she has helped us. She has won victory after victory for the church down through the centuries, especially by the praying of the Most Holy Rosary, including spiritual victories over error and heresy, as well as military victories over the Muslims. Against all odds, Catholic forces have routed militant Muslims time and time again, on the sea and on the land. In fact, Lourdes was one of the last holdouts of the Muslims in France. The castle of Lourdes. Something like nine million human-sacrificing, devil-worshipping Aztec Indians converted after she visited Mexico in December 1531. She has proven that only she can help you. St. Louis de Montfort spoke of this when he prophesied the power of Mary over all devils will be particularly outstanding In the last period of time, she will extend the kingdom of Christ over the idolaters and Muslims, and there will come a glorious era when Mary is the ruler and queen of hearts. This is why the age of peace for the church that is to come will also be the age of Mary, the triumph of her immaculate heart. Just a pious dream? No. Although we could say much, much more, are we not convinced that Our Lady is truly the Alpha and the Omega of what it means to be the church? Listen to Blessed Francis Palau. All that is preached and told about the glories of Mary can be said in a more sublime way about the Holy Church. God has ordained that in the purity and virginity and motherhood of Mary, this miserable world should see the purity and virginity and motherhood of the church. Anyone who wants to know what it means to be a perfect member of Christ, look to the Blessed Mary and you will find it. Wow. Now, keeping this in mind will preserve us from the errors of ecclesiology that we're being barraged with at this moment, floating around right now. It will keep us piously loving the church in this time of her passion. Now, with the help of a couple of popes, of happy and holy memory, we should spend a few moments to better understand the slivers of truth found in those somewhat impious statements I mentioned earlier. Listen to Pope Pius IX. He says, although one of the church's marks is holiness, one holy, Catholic, apostolic, holy. Why? Because she is holy in her founder, holy in her teaching holy in the sanctity of a great many of her members. Nonetheless, she has also within her bosom many members who are not holy, who afflict and persecute and misjudge her. Pope Pius IX, her own are attacking her, misjudging her, persecuting her. His prophecy was true at the time and has come true again. Let's not be counted among those who do these things. Let's not be among those poor unfortunates. True devotion to the Immaculate Virgin prevents this from happening. Pope Pius XII, this is what he says. 
Certainly the loving mother, the church is spotless in the sacraments by which she gives birth to and nourishes her children. In the faith, she's spotless, which she has always preserved and violate in her sacred laws imposed on all, in the evangelical counsels which she recommends, in those heavenly gifts and extraordinary graces through which, with inexhaustible fecundity, she generates a host of martyrs, virgins and confessors. But it cannot be laid to her charge if some members fall weak and wounded. Don't blame the church for sinners. Some sinful prelate or person back there, don't blame the church for that person. They are the ones who failed. Let's listen to Blessed Francis Palau. He explains it very well talking to the church. First, he says, I looked carefully at each part to see if there was any disproportion, blemish or defect. But my heart, wounded by her presence, repeated, you are all beautiful, all lovely. There's no stain, no blemish or imperfection at all. So he's looking at her in a mystical transport. She's come to him as a young, veiled virgin. Then he asked the church, does not sin disfigure your members? The church responds in the person of the beautiful young virgin who is mysteriously veiled. Okay, sin does not belong to me. Anything unclean upon this earth, it's not mine. It belongs to mankind. And are not the people by chance parts of your body? Asked Blessed Francis. She says, through what they have and have received from God, they are flesh of my flesh and members of my body. But anything which is culpable in them belongs to them and to the devil. Have you always been all beautiful? And she responds, I shall be and always have been and always will be. Virgin. Think of Calvary, folks. Our Lord looked like sin being all beaten up, crucified between two thieves. But he was always innocence itself. So to the church at this time of great crisis may look like sin. But she's not. It's not true. She's innocent. People are looking at the church and are pointing at you. You're the problem in the world. Just as they did with our Lord on Calvary. We have to stand firm with him and with her. Let us once again then flee the flooding river of naturalism, rationalism, and impiety, which tries to bring things of God down to our level and make God think like us. We must avoid becoming bad Catholics. Once an official of the French army asked St. Bernadette whether she feared an invasion of the Prussians. She responded, I don't fear that. I fear bad Catholics. Then the man res responded, don't you fear anything else? No, nothing. Just bad Catholics. We don't have a Muslim problem today, folks. We got a bad Catholic problem today. That's what we've got. Here are some things we can do as dutiful and pious Catholics. Number one. Love the church and everything traditionally associated with her. All that is contained inside her courts. Piously measure and map out her sacred confines by way of study and meditation. Read only those things that improve and build up godliness. Books that usually have an author whose name begins with S. St. Augustine, St. Thomas, St. Bernard, St. Teresa, St. John of the Cross. Second of all, Deepen your devotion to the church's spotless mirror of the Blessed Virgin Mary, especially by praying her rosary every day. She will help you resist all error and sin and crush the evil fiend. Third, renew daily your baptismal vows with holy water that require us to remain inside the church, come what may. I'm not leaving, I'm staying inside our confines. Here's my baptismal vows. I reject Satan, all his works and promises in the world and all the things with them. And I accept that Christ as my Lord. I believe the church is one holy Catholic and apostolic. Okay, number four. Long to add to her glory by striving to be good member of the church yourself. 
loving God and your fellow man, ever seeking the salvation of others. Maybe you're afraid. Maybe you're thinking to yourself, who would want to be Catholic now? I know I've had this thought many times. These are dark days for the church. Listen to St. Hilary. It is a prerogative of the church that she is the vanquisher when she is persecuted. That she captures our intellects when her doctrines are questioned. That she conquers all at the very moment when she is abandoned by all. Have hope. Don't give up. People will convert. Be a part of that. I will conclude tonight with these edifying words of Blessed Francis Palau. During the last days of her life, the seraphic mother, St. Teresa of Jesus, at last exclaimed with great confidence, I am a daughter of the church. So practically her last words. And this tender and sweet mother opened her arms, received in her bosom a daughter, Teresa, who had been faithful during this miserable life. In this embrace, the human seraphim found her eternal repose that she now enjoys in heaven. How sweet, how pleasant, how delightful must be the repose in a virgin mother's arms. And how pure is the triumphant church after the horrible agitations, disorder, and convulsions of this present life. Think well, wayfaring and pilgrim man on earth, he says. Do not escape from the church. Do not avoid her presence. Believe this loving and sweet mother, whatever she tells you officially and doctrinally has always been taught through the history of the world. We know our faith. Put your hope in her. Love her and find in her bosom the happiness that you seek. There is no salvation without her. Outside her arms you will find only frightening convulsions and horrible torments that last eternally. Blessed Francis Palau. What a privilege, what a grace, what an honor to be a Roman Catholic. Would you do me the kindness of coming three more nights? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.